Hello and welcome back everyone to Zoo Victoria's Conservation Conversations. My name is Dr Amy Katsia and I'm a threatened species biologist at Zoo Victoria. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all listening in from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. Welcome. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands, waters and communities of Australia and of course, contribution to our wildlife. A big welcome and thank you to some of our major partners who are joining us tonight. These include the Dyson family, the Cochrane family, the Scobie and Claire McKinnon Trust, the Victorian and Australian governments, Zoos Victoria members, in particular the Bandicoot Club, who are the most amazing group of young people spreading the word of our threatened species. And thank you to all our donors, animal adopters, gifts and will supporters, conservation partners, and most importantly, you. Because without your support, we wouldn't be able to do this work and help save a species from the brink of extinction. So over the next hour, I'll be taking you behind the scenes of some of the work we've been doing to save the mainland Eastern Barred Bandicoot from extinction. Joining me tonight will be Dr. Michael Lynch, who's Head of Veterinary Services at Melbourne Zoo, and David Williams, our Guardian Dog Program Coordinator. If you have any questions at all during this webinar, you can post them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we will have some time to answer some of those questions. So to start, I'd like to acknowledge all the partners that make up the Eastern Bide Bandicoot recovery team, because it's due to the hard work and the dedication of all of these organizations and the many, many, many people that stand behind these logos that is helping save the Eastern Bide Bandicoot from extinction. So Eastern Bide Bandicoots are, without a doubt, the most amazing animal on the planet. Now, some people may say I'm a little bit biased because I've worked with them for 16 years, but I don't think so. From the beady eyes that bulge out of their heads to that extraordinary conical nose, to a tiny little tail that wags when they wake up from an anaesthetic, to those hind feet that allow them to jump up to 1.2 metres high, which is pretty impressive when you're only 15 centimetres tall. Now, what's not to love about Eastern Bar Bandicoots? Well, if you're not convinced yet, how about they have the second shortest gestation of any mammal at just 12 and a half days. Mum will carry her young in her pouch until she's walking on tippy toes to stop her belly from dragging along on the ground. At about 55 days, she weans her young. And then shortly after that, they're left to fend for themselves. And from three months old, they're having babies of their own. So Eastern Bard Bandicoots don't have a set breeding season. When conditions are really good, they can breed throughout the year. They can have up to five litters of two to three young in each litter, but they do tend to do most of their breeding during the cooler months. And this is usually when there's a lot more rain around and the soil is, is softer and easier to dig in. Now, these guys are digging machines. They dig for their food and they're digging for worms and beetle grub larvae. And we know that one bandicoot in one night can turn over up to 13 kilos of soil. Now that's pretty impressive for an animal that weighs less than a kilo. And this digging is, is really beneficial for the soil. So it, it decreases soil compaction whilst increasing soil mo moisture and soil nutrient content. So they have a really um, important role in soil health and that's why they're known as ecological engineers. Now, one thing I really, really love about Eastern Bride Bandicoots is just how relaxed and easygoing they can be. So this mum is quite comfortable lying on her back in my lap while her two very large pouch young suckle. And they're so easy to handle that my boys have been coming along with me releasing and monitoring bandicoots for many years. But there is a dark side to the Eastern Bard Bandicoot. Under the cover of darkness, they can inflict horrific injuries on one another. It's not unusual to find a bandicoot that's had its tail ripped off or it's got shredded ears or patches of fur missing. This is of course males fighting with other males for access to females. 
And I'm always amazed at, at how well they can recover from these injuries without any intervention at all. Now, despite how amazing Eastern Barred Bandicoots are, they are classified as extinct in the wild on mainland Australia. They were once found across the grassy woodlands of southwest Victoria from Melbourne to the South Australian border, an area known as the Basalt Plains. But with European settlement, populations began to, to, to decline. And this is partly due to um, almost all of their habitat being destroyed or replaced with farmland. But if this was the only threat that they faced, then I do believe that we'd still have eastern barred bandicoots around in the wild today on mainland Australia. The reason that we don't is due to the introduced red fox. Now with the arrival of foxes in Victoria, eastern barred bandicoots began to disappear across the, the landscape. And the last place they were found was in the city of Hamilton in southwest Victoria. But this population was also declining and in 1988, there was thought to be just 200 mainland eastern barred bandicoots left. And it was at this point that the eastern barred bandicoot recovery team was formed. And the first thing they did was to collect as many bandicoots as they could from the wild, because they knew that if they didn't, we would lose this species forever. So how do you save a species from near extinction when one fox in an area of eastern barred bandicoots is one fox too many? and fox eradication on the mainland just isn't feasible. Well, there are several ways, and one of those is through captive breeding. So now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Michael Lynch, who's going to talk about Zoos Victoria's role in the captive breeding program. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Amy. Yeah, look, I've, I've been at the zoo for uh, quite a while. I was here when the bandicoots first came into captivity. Um, it was really a uh, you know, sombre moment because, um, uh, we knew this uh, population was in, in trouble and uh, the government authorities have tried to establish a captive population in large pens out on the outskirts of Melbourne of Woodlands. But uh, really, um, once you put a fence around an animal, even if you think you're giving it a lot of space, uh, you still got to manage that animal and they run into all sorts of problems because they were basically fencing the animals um, and then couldn't really monitor or manage them. And so that's when they turned to the zoo for help. And uh, during the early days of the, the program, we would still get animals in from the wild. Uh, there were animals still at community park lands in a fenced enclosure at Hamilton, but animals are actually in the wild at Hamilton and uh, things like young ones being, you know, predated by people's house cats and things are very sad. And then it, that all stopped. And uh, that was really a sad moment because it was the, 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 that species had ceased to exist as a wild animal uh, there and it's its natural form. But here at the zoo, uh, we had the issues of setting up and managing this to get the captive breeding going. Now, ultimately, you want to save animals in their own habitat. You don't want to be captive breeding them. That, that's a critically endangered animal when we get to that point. Uh, but unfortunately, we were at that point. And so the uh, we had to work out the husbandry, the of those animals, how to house them, what sort of enclosures, the diets, their medical issues, uh, when to, how to breed them, separate, um, separate young off and all that sort of stuff. Um, and really interesting because I look at the new species that we're getting in with Zoot Victoria now, like Plains Wanderers and Bull Bull Frogs, it's the same process. The, the keeping and veterinary staff are working out how to look after those uh, animals here in captivity. But of course our aim is always getting animals back in the wild. And it was a great day when, um, when we basically built up captive numbers and we we're gonna have the first, the first release back to fenced enclosures in the wild, because of course, foxes were a major issue with these animals. Uh, and again, we had the, the issues of how would these captive bred animals survive in the wild? And, um, and uh, you know, would they be able to forage normally? Would they behave as wild animals? What was the impact of captivity? And uh, so we, would, we had uh, programs to try and prepare them for release, uh, which was increasing the natural foods, making sure they were naturally nest, make, nesting out of natural materials, making digs and doing all the things a wild bandicoot should do. And then really working out, we ultimately wanted to track them in the wild with telemetry devices. And that was a tremendous challenge to get an adequate telemetry device 
as um, and so really the information we got back on bandicoots from the wild was from some telemetry we managed to suture onto animals and also direct observations of the animals once once they were released that they were foraging uh, foraging well and uh, yeah so it was um, it was a very good um, a very good time when we could uh, successfully breed them and then uh, release them so I'll go back to Amy now to talk about the management of those. Uh, wild populations. Oh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, so look, the management of these, these wild populations is really important. And we've got a, a number of aspects to manage. One is the health of the actual population, uh, what diseases are impacting that population, but also um, rather than release animals just from captivity to establish new populations, there's been a fair bit of moving animals between those wild populations. And of course, they're in different parts of Victoria. And so one of the very important things we did was do a disease risk analyses uh, whenever we move animals either from captivity to the wild or animals from one wild population from another. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want those animals to take diseases from one location and introduce them to another. Uh, French Island is a really good example of that where uh, there was some concern that the bandicoots might introduce diseases uh, or parasites and things that aren't, uh, weren't normally um, on French Island. So we had to go through an exhaustive process of seeing what do we know about bandicoots and their diseases and their parasites and uh, are these parasites exotic to, to particular locations? Could they impact other animals? And of course, when you do that, there's often a lot of knowledge gaps, but we came down to basically making assessments of risk. The other thing with us uh, vets is that while we can treat parasites uh, uh, in animals, once we've got them in hand, we're doing health checks, we don't necessarily want to try and make these animals uh, basically, you know, wipe out all their natural microflora, which includes their microparasites and macroparasites and things. So these are, these are things that have evolved with these animals over millions of years. And really they can tolerate low burdens of, of, these, um, of these things that they've evolved with. It's only when you get a combination of factors, like you get overcrowding of animals, you get poor nutrition. A lot of these then, uh, these, these parasites and things that are carried by animals, we can become quite, quite significant. So captive breeding is just one way in which we're fighting the extinction of eastern barred bandicoots. Another is by releasing bandicoots into reserves surrounded by predator exclusion fences. Now these fences are incredibly effective, but they can cost up to $40,000 per kilometre. And once the fence is built, then they continue to cost. And this is through daily maintenance and monitoring. Because these fences are put under a, a lot of stress, you know, it's not unusual for a tree limb or an entire tree to fall down on sections of the fence. Our kangaroos jump into them and weaken the fence or echidnas might burrow under them and foxes will take advantage of any weak spot to gain access into that fence reserve and to the bandicoots. So, so that daily maintenance and monitoring is incredibly important. Now, we, there are currently four fence preserves across Victoria that have an eastern barred bandicoot population. These are Woodlands Historic Park near Melbourne Airport, Hamilton Community Parklands in, in Hamilton in southwest Victoria, Mount Rothwell, which isn't too far from Geelong, and the newest site, Tiverton, which is near Mortlake in western Victoria. That's where bandicoots were released late last year. So combine these Four sites offer around 1,800 hectares of suitable habitat for bandicoots and more importantly, fox-free habitat for bandicoots, where, where the bandicoots can thrive behind those fences. But the recovery team works off a very conservative estimate of one bandicoot per hectare. And so whilst these, these fence sites, along with the captive breeding program, have prevented the extinction of the eastern barred bandicoot, we really need more fox-free land to be able to recover and remove the eastern barred from the threatened species list. And that's where islands come in. So almost six years ago, the first eastern barred bandicoot release occurred onto tiny little Churchill Island. 
Now Churchill might be small, but it's incredibly important in the Isambard Bandicoot Island story. And that's because Isambards have never, ever, ever been found across any of the Victorian islands. So Churchill was our demonstration site to make sure that Bandicoots um, could live uh, the island life quite happily and that the, the Bandicoots didn't cause any undesirable impact on the environment. Now, Churchill turned out to be a massive success and that paved the way for a release onto Phillip Island two years later. Now, the recovery team were a little bit apprehensive about this release because we, we weren't sure if it was going to be a, a success because it was the first time that we'd released bandicoots into an area with feral cats. But due to the incredible work that the Phillip Island Nature Parks do at managing Phillip and Churchill Island, the Phillip Island release was an incredible success. And the bandicoot population there is doing really, really well. So that allowed us to go ahead with our third and final island release onto French Island. Now this was by far the most logistically challenging project ever. I first went to French Island 14 years ago with members of the recovery team to assess the suitability of the island for bandicoots. And once we were happy that it did, it did contain suitable bandicoot habitat, it was time to seek permission from the French Island community because we knew that without community support that this release would never be a success. At first, the community wasn't really on board with the idea, but, but over the years through listening to the community and conducting research, releasing bandicoots onto Churchill and Phillip Islands, and even inviting the whole French Island community out for dinner one night uh, onto Churchill Island and some, uh, including some bandicoot spotlighting, they, they slowly began to fall in love with the, the Eastern Borough Bandicoot. So in 2019, we released 74 bandicoots onto French Island. This was the biggest release we have ever done and by far the most challenging. And, and that's because we didn't just collect bandicoots from four sites across the state. They all had to arrive by boat. And I will never forget the release night. Yeah, I think I'd had about two hours sleep because I'd been up late collecting bandicoots on Churchill Island so we could take them over to French Island the following morning. So I was completely exhausted. And, and I remember the release night and all of the community members that came out to help carry the little blue boxes with the bandicoots inside and they helped release bandicoots into their new home. So it was a really, really special and emotional night. And you know, it's amazing how it takes so many years of planning and preparation of these releases and then it's all over in a couple of minutes but then that's the point where you start to worry because French Island also has a feral cat population and so you start to worry you know whether the, your release is going to be a success or not. So how are the French Island bandicoots doing? I am just pausing now so I can share my screen. And now I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. Well, they seem to be doing really, really well. Um, I'm not catching too many in my traps when we do um, when we do trap the population to assess the, their health and their condition and their breeding status. But I am finding lots of bandicoots on on my camera traps, and and this is really really wonderful to see. So these are just some of the images that I'm getting. So you know, there's females with with young at foot or bulging pouches showing that you know they've got large pouch young in there. Um, so lots and lots and lots of, of, of images on my camera traps and this is just absolutely fantastic you know when you see these images and you see that your population is doing well and yeah you, you don't need to worry uh, about them yeah it's just absolutely fantastic and then seeing females with four young at foot I have never ever ever seen four young at foot before occasionally I've seen four pouch young but we never know if they all survive to, to this stage. So, so it's absolutely wonderful to, to see these images that we're collecting on the cameras. So stop share. 
So islands provide around 1800 hectares of fox free habitat and alone they could be responsible for removing the eastern bar bandicoot from the threatened species list. But we're not stopping there because one day we would love to have eastern bar bandicoots back in the wild on mainland Victoria once again. And there might just be a way that we can achieve that. And that's by using some of our four-legged friends. And now I'm going to hand over to Dave Williams, who's going to talk about that project. Thank you, Amy. So this part of the story actually started thousands of years ago. We had old shepherds in the fields in Europe protecting their flocks from threats like bears and cougars and thieves. And they used guardian dogs to keep those threats away. So specially trained, specially selectively bred animals that bonded with those animals and were quite territorial and defensive. So they chased away all those threats. Um, first time I came across them was when I was a student in Warrnambool and a guy called Swampy Master was using them to protect his, his chickens. And Swampy found fame in the movie that came afterwards, uh, Oddball. And that was based on what became known as the, the, the Warrnambool method. So there was a problem on a, an island just off the coast of Warrnambool called Middle Island. It was full of a colony of penguins. And then it became a lot less full because foxes were getting out there and eating the penguins. So the council and various other people managing the problem were having awful trouble trying to stop the foxes getting out there. And really, they tried all the normal stuff. So, you know, you're shooting and you're trapping and you're den destruction and all those sorts of things um, without success. So eventually, Swampy and I got together and we suggested to the council via DSE, uh, which is DELP in the olden days, um, that these guardian dogs that Swampy was using on his farm to protect his chickens, they, in this case, Marimas, they were the, the Marima guardian dog, and they were might be able to abate the fox predation and, um, and save that particular colony. So that went really well. Um, and Swampy was the first guy who introduced me to those dogs. Now, uh, when I was at uni, I was working for Swampy. Um, on his farm, earning a bit of cash. And one week, one of the puppies came and sort of sat next to me. And that week I didn't get paid. Instead, I had a nice new dog. So that's when I first started learning about these, these amazing guardian dogs. And Maremas are one of many guardian breeds, but probably the most common one in Australia. Um, through that project, the Middle Island project, we had a lot of learning about how to, how to make these, these dogs work in conservation. It probably was the first time it was used in this way uh, ever, really. There have been uh, places where I guess guardian dogs work with, for conservation in that they keep predators away from people's stock, which stops people killing those predators, but never before had they been used to protect the, the wild animals and native animals. So it's a little bit of a twist um, on traditional usage of them. Um, so after Middle Island, we had a, you know, that was the, the first thing, that was, that was the, the project that really inspired the zoos project. We moved on to gannets. So there's a population of gannets at Point Danger over near Portland. Um, same thing, foxes were getting in there and messing them up. So we were able to um, introduce dogs over there and that abated that fox uh, predation again. And that colony, which had stopped, uh, really stopped staying on the, on the point there and an abandoned breeding, uh, it was able to, uh, yeah, get it going again. It was kind of funny because on both of those occasions, when we first introduced the dogs to these wild animals, we had no idea how the wild animals would respond. Uh, so there was a couple of sort of classic moments where we put the dog out, we wait to see what happens. And yeah, obviously they went well, but um, at one point, when we first put the dogs out there, the, the, the gannets were, were pairing up. So they were offering each other gifts of seaweed and, and, and fish and things. And they started offering the puppies fish, which the puppies thought was great. Um, but then of course, when it came time to lay some eggs, the puppies thought they were just getting more gifts. So in the end, we had to exclude the dogs from the colony itself and we sort of had them like a dog moat around the colony because they'd nick all the eggs and then they'd keep foxes from coming across that space in between. So um, yeah, there's been lots of learning along the way to say the least. But anyway, in about 2014, I think we started talking to Jesus Victoria about potentially doing something with bandicoots. Um, and the recovery team and all the other partners, of course, it's a very complicated thing looking after a species, but um, we all got together and had a bit of a chat and eventually decided that um, we'd give it a go. So that setup and design was really, um, yeah, it took a good couple of years, but time, time we've got the training, sorted out a precinct, 
I had to learn a lot about bandicoots because I hadn't worked with them before. Um, and yeah, we, we sort of got going. And one of the first things we did was we, we brought along a, a dog called Albus. So Albus was named by the Cochrane family, who one of the generous sponsors of the project. Uh, and Albus, is, his job is to be the ambassador dog. So we realized early on that we needed to tell this story. We needed to tell it with a dog. Uh, we needed to do some, some media and those sorts of events to get the story out there. But we also knew that the working dogs needed to be trained for working and a dog that's, that bonds with you know, animals and not so much people and keeps people out of its territory, the guard dog or lifestyle guardian dog in this case doesn't really do well at meeting journalists and the like. So we had Elvis to, to um, there he is there as a pup. Pretty early on with my time with the zoo. Um, good looking boy, isn't he? But anyway, that's what that's his job. So he's a very photogenic boy. He'll stop and stand and for a little while anyway. <laughs> but um, and yeah, and, and, and provide opportunities for photos and those sorts of things. But he is also a working bred marimba. So he does actually work. Albus still lives with me and he would not be able to be comfortable in a yard um, you know, in, in a suburban area. He's a sort of dog that needs to work. So he's got sheep and chickens and ducks and quail and all sorts of things he looks after, my little child. So without that work, he'd be kind of hard to man handle. He's a pretty full on dog. Um, and they, are, they can be. It's worth mentioning here that, you know, the dogs aren't really great suburban animals. They're, they're working, working bred. Thousands of years of selective breeding to create the behaviours that make them great working dogs can be problematic in town. Um, yeah, so good to think about that. But look, there was many stages. At one time, we worked through uh, getting the dogs used to, as very puppies, getting them used to, to bandicoots. And we had to also learn how the bandicoots reacted to the dogs, a little bit like the birds previously. And Turned out they didn't react much at all, which is pretty good. We had them in a specially designed uh, area where they had kind of fence-to-fence -fence access with, with each other. So they had a little perspex window with, with holes in it that we could open and close for periods of exposure. So also about 1,200 mil up, then there was just mesh yeah, and tin in between that. So we could control that they could see each other, they could smell each other, they could hear each other all the time, they probably smell each other all the time, but um, that went really well. Um, so eventually we started doing face-to-face. -face. There's a window there you can see. There's a little pup, that's Wednesday, I think, and a bandicoot on the other side. And to be honest, we waited a very long time for that photo because whilst Wednesday, that particular animal, was quite keen on looking in there, the, the bandicoot just hardly ever looked out. They were really kind of not interested in the dogs at all, which is perfect. And that's what we were doing. Um, we weren't actually bonding the animals together. We were bonding the dogs to sheep. Uh, like the traditional method, but we wanted them to ignore the bandicoot. So there's an older Wednesday sitting at the window. Uh, and the second good shot of that. But yeah, we wanted them really just to ignore the bandicoot. So having bandicoots in their life all the time is a bit like having a magpie that lives in the yard. That's you know not something that we wanted them to respond to or to take interest in. And that's basically how we've done it. They've been rewarded for ignoring bandicoots and for leaving them alone. And of course, also rewarded for keeping you know, good relationships and bonding with the sheep. And then the sheep and the dogs and the bandicoots could all live happily in the grassland together. There's an, an older Albus, still not very old, but looking pretty good. Yeah, so once we started getting the dogs interested in the bandicoots, well, not interested actually, but introduced them to bandicoots or rewarding them for not being interested, more to the point, uh, we had a really old bandicoot called Lionel. And Lionel was really mellow. He didn't care what happened at all. But after a while, we needed a bandicoot that was a little bit more like a wild bandicoot. So we came across this fellow Dyson, who was a captive bred male. And Dyson was a, bit, <laughs> a little bit problematic. He was crazy, and that's why we got him. But it was perfect. Um, and Dyson was named after the Dyson bequest, another generous donor, funnily enough. But Dyson was really quite a, a rat bag of, of an animal. So he pressed, pressed the dog's buttons. He made them, if they were going to react to an animal, they'd react to Dyson because he was really quite... Uh, an unpredictable fellow. So, you know, there were many, 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 many stages and many, many different uh, little places where we just kept changing the training around to keep them interested. Um, and then, of course, we went out to the field site. So we're working out there now. And the first site is a National Trust property out of Skipton. And then we've got another property we'll be working on at Dunkeld uh, with a pastoral company out there. But before we even get near the site, we get out to the site, we put out heaps and heaps of movement sensing cameras. So we're monitoring the fox activity from before we started. Then we build a fence 
and we monitor the, the fox activity after the fence so that we can tell that the fence itself, it's only 1,200 high, the fence, it keeps dogs and sheep and bandicoots in, but it doesn't affect fox movement. But we wanted to prove that. So pre-fence monitoring, we had post-fence post monitoring, but before we had dogs and sheep, and we can see what the baseline fox activity is. Then we introduce the dogs and sheep, like you can see in the photo here. And as you would expect, the dogs keep the sheep safe and happy and they keep the foxes away. So before we even consider releasing bandicoots, we know that the dogs are having an effect on the fox activity, so that it's gonna be safe to release bandicoots. And then of course, post EBV release, we monitor very heavily. So we're monitoring with those cameras again. We've got microchip readers, so all the animals are microchipped. Microchip readers, they can, they've got a little bait in them, so it's like a little square and they stick their head down to, to lick some peanut butter out and hopefully pop the, the microchip past the scanner so we can identify them that way. We also set out a cage trapping so that we can, well, before we release them, we attach radio transmitters. And then as they fall off, they're only attached to their tails. Uh, we re-trap them again and, and reattach them. And it's pretty weather dependent, yeah, if it's wet, they fall off and so on. So for the first two months, we have a look really carefully with those transmitters on. And we then have a research assistant out in the field with, a, with an antenna walking around, checking on those animals every day. So it's very intensive. Um, and then we also have GPS collars on the dogs and on the sheep, so we can monitor their movement as well. So between all that, we can see what's happening with the bandicoots, we can see what's happening with the foxes and how that's interacting with the movement of the dogs and the dogs' movement obviously is interacting with the sheep that they're bonded to. So we're keeping a pretty close eye on it. We've just passed that bit uh, and it's skipped to now and we can see a lot of those photos. This is actually Albus back at the zoo during training. But uh, in those early photos, all those photos, the field photos we saw before, we had a nice big boy out there. His name was McKinnon. He was named in honour of the Clarence Scobie McKinnon Trust, who have an association with the property at Skipton that the National Trust are working with us on. Um, and when we first had the dogs trained at the zoo, we had, as you can see in this picture, Dorper sheep, those black-headed Dorpers. And they were wonderful. But when we introduced new sheep, because we needed to have different sheep out there, McKinnon wouldn't have it. He liked his old sheep. So he actually split the old sheep and the new sheep. So we had to then remove the daubers in order to allow the bonding to happen between our dogs and the new sheep. And then we could carry on with the program. So just another little story to tell you some of the, I guess, the challenges that we come across along the way and things that don't go as we thought they maybe would. Um, but yeah, so look, we monitor. We monitored all the way through and we're monitoring very heavily now, um, you know, once we release those EBVs, of course, we continue to monitor them and then the maremmas are there protecting them from the threat of foxes. But there are other threats to bandicoots health once we release them. Um, and we need our vet teams to come out and monitor the health of the animals in the wild as well. So to discuss that further, it's over to Michael. Thank you, Mike. So the other, the other sort of thing we wanted to know was what could impact these animals when they are in destinations. And particularly for Phillip Island and French Island, one of the things is cats, and cats can uh, uh, directly predate on small bandicoots, but they also carry a, a protozoal parasite disease called toxoplasma, uh, which I'm sure many people have heard of, which, uh, which is very lethal to bandicoots. And so we, we wanted to know um, uh, what is the impact of this disease on bandicoots. And so I think probably a good time to roll uh, the video now. So basically, um, what we uh, here we are doing a um, going to take a blood sample from this bandicoot. One of the ways we can detect if animals have been exposed is to measure uh, antibodies in their blood to see if they've been exposed to toxoplasma. Another way is that we get bandicoots back from the wild that have died. They might have been hit by a car. They might have died of something else. We can a, a see if did they die of toxoplasma, uh, which we have seen. Uh, or have they uh, been exposed to infection and, and they uh, survived it? So we have a passive surveillance through that post-mortem surveillance. And this is our active surveillance where we're going down in the field. Uh, we don't want animals caught just for us. We piggybacking on the back of uh, normal population monitoring. And we're taking the opportunity to, to do a health check as well as take a blood sample to look for exposure to toxoplasma. And we know from uh, a student we had here at the vet department in Melbourne Zoo, uh, about 90% of cats on these islands carrying this, uh, this, um, this organism. And, and when they're kittens, they can excrete a, 
a lot of this parasite into the environment. It can survive quite a long time. So here's me on the way we take blood from these bandicoots because we want a fair amount of sample, about a mil and a half is introducing that needle into the um, femoral vein. And this bandicoot, you can see it's not moving, it's anaesthetized through gas delivered in that little face mask. So we, uh, this is down on French Island, whereas I was there recently with the nurse and it's a pretty slow bleed. You can see there uh, taking that but we'll spin that blood down and we're in a collaborative project uh, with the University of Melbourne to look, uh, look for this um, uh, exposure to the parasite. As I said, we're also taking the opportunity to do a general health check of all these animals, look at their body condition. I'm looking at the eyes of this animal because we have seen in some animals uh, cataracts uh, in quite young animals, which we're trying to gauge a prevalence on and a possible cause. Uh, you're always concerned about um, genetic causes in these animals that are these populations that have been through extreme genetic bottle bottlenecks like these bandicoots. They come from very few individuals. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite important. Uh, I've checked its body condition. Now we're going over and uh, we're weighing each uh, animal. And if we go down uh, on regular trappings, we can get a sort of a bit of a longitudinal data uh, on the animal, uh, on its exposure to toxoplasma, if it uh, has been exposed uh, and what its weight's doing. And um, I'm looking in the mouth here to just, just check the tooth wear, gives me an idea of the uh, age of the animal. Um, and also if its jaw is well aligned, because another genetic issue can be jaw malalignment. But what we've found, we're not really finding bandicoots that have uh, got antibodies to toxoplasma. And now that's a bit of a worry because it suggests that uh, animals that are exposed um, don't survive exposure. And we know animals can be exposed. We've got to, uh, because we have had animals back to our passive surveillance program uh, to, um, and found toxoplasma in them. But what we think the crucial thing is, is that the Milan managers of both French Island and Phillip Island have reduced cat density down to a level where the environmental challenge of this organism is probably being knocked down enough that the bandicoot populations can thrive. And every other indication is that the bandicoot populations are doing well at these locations. So um, we've got a bunch of um, uh, testing still to do on that and we can reach some final conclusions that we can pass on to the species managers. And that, that's what our role is really to say, how important is disease in these situations? Thanks, Michael. That was an amazing video. Yeah, I always love watching you work and you make it look so easy when you bleed a bandicoot, but I know just how difficult it is to get that needle into those teeny tiny, tiny little bandicoot veins. So we've been having some great questions come through tonight and we're going to try and answer as many as we can. I don't think we'll get to all of them, but but we'll give it a go. Um, so the first one that's come in is, are Eastern Bard Bandicoots nocturnal? Yes, they are. Um, they're, they're strictly nocturnal. So they come out of their nest probably a couple of hours after dusk. So if you see a bandicoot around in the daylight, you've probably either disturbed it from its nest or there might be something wrong with it. So it may have contracted toxoplasmosis. So it might actually be pretty sick. But usually you only ever see them at night. Another one I've seen come up a few times is um, why were the French Island community not supportive in the beginning of an Eastern Bard Bandicoot release? Well, they had a really, really, really good reason. Now, back in the 1800s, koalas were introduced to French Island. So the community there know, um, well, they have experience of a native animal being introduced to their island. So that's why they were very wary. And, and that's why they were asking questions and making sure that we did our research. And I'm really glad that they did. So, so they were always interested in the project and wanted to learn more. And, and so it was because of the French Island community and asking the questions that that the release onto Churchill Islands, the demonstration site happened and all this research has been done. And then we, there was a, the release onto Phillip Island. So we knew how bandicoots could cope in the presence of feral cats. Um, so a lot of this all work um, really stemmed from the community's interest and engagement in the project and making sure that, you know, we'd done our work to make sure that 
the release would be a success for for Bandicoots and and the community and the island as a whole. So one for you now, Dave. Do maremmas make good pets? Thanks, Amy. That's a really great question, actually. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there's a little, there's a few issues with having maremmas as pets. Some people do do it successfully, but they generally have space, they've got acreage, and something for the dog to do all day. So something for it to guard, be it sheep or chickens or something. Um, they don't often do well when they're in, in suburban situations, so, so small suburban backyards or, or, or apartment living, that sort of thing, uh, because they, they're working dogs, they're working bred dogs, and they, they struggle with it. If you're around and you can do it, and you, you, know, you can take it out and give it the exercise that they need, that sort of thing can be done, but you've got to be available and pretty devoted, is sort of my experience. Um, so much so that there's actually a Marema specific rescue group, Marema Rescue Victoria, and most states have one. So particularly after the movie was released, there are a lot of people uh, probably buying these beautiful puppies, and they are, without doing a lot of research into the breed. So look, can be done, but probably not great if you haven't got a lot of space for them. And Dave, another one for you. Do you always use the Marema breed for guardian dogs? Thanks, Amy. Another really interesting question. Our, our listeners are obviously kind of keying in. Um, there are other breeds of guardian dogs um, and they're great. There's like 40 of them. Every, every sort of Eastern European, uh, even not even the Eastern Europeans, but lots of different countries have guardian dog breeds, but they're not very common in Australia. So marimas are quite common and available for working strains of the breed out here. Um, but there, look, there's heaps of different options and you'll find that sometimes you can match the dog to the threat. So in Australia, we don't have a lot of large predators, but if you look at America, uh, particularly America, or even Europe in the wilder parts, you've got things like wolves and bears and big cats, you know, cougars and things that are attacking people's livestock. So you need a bigger dog and probably more of them and uh, for those sorts of situations where we, when we're mostly looking at maybe wild dogs, but more commonly foxes in Australia, um, the smaller, lighter, easier to handle wherever are probably a better choice. Michael, I've got a question for you. How did you get your, your job as a Melbourne Zoo vet? Yeah, I, I, think, I think a combination of hard work and, and good fortune that, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, before I studied veterinary science, I, uh, I studied zoology. And really that's when I became very interested in the natural, uh, natural world and um, conservation of species, uh, biology. Uh, so then I studied vet and then I really wanted to work with wildlife and I, um, after a few years in private practice, got a position here as a trainee position at the zoo, doing a master's degree. So, uh, and it just went on, on from there. So yeah, it is a really rewarding job. Thanks. Dave, what do you love about your job and what do you find most challenging? Ah, thanks, Amy. Oh, look. I've got a, I'm really lucky to have my job working with animals is it's just fantastic and I've completely fallen in love with these big white white dogs it's um, and all the animals I've come across through that really um, it's been quite a lucky break for me in a lot of ways um, things I don't love are the challenges I think it's just getting a new idea out there so you know when we first mentioned that we thought these dogs would go out on island and protect penguins we got a lot of uh, a lot of laughter. <laughs> so it took a little while to get people, I guess, tuned in that we were serious and that we thought this could work. And um, getting a chance to do these projects is the thing that's probably the biggest challenge of all. But then also that turns into the, yeah, a great reward too. So it's a double-edged sword. Now this last question, I'm going to ask everybody because this is a great question. So I'll go first. So it's what's been your favorite highlight or favorite memory working on the Eastern Bide Bandicoot program? Now, for me, without a doubt, it's the French Island release. Um, it's It was just an amazing night. It took so many years and so many people and so much planning and, and preparation. And then it was over a couple of, of big nights and days that you know we got the bandicoots there and yeah I just remember even through my exhaustion I think I'd had about two hours sleep in a 48 hour period so I was beyond exhausted but I remember getting to to the release site and as you walk down the track into the release 
site, which is called Blue Gums, um, you've got this dense tea tree on either side of, of the track. And then the track just bends around the corner and the whole place just opens up. And way in the distance, you can see the sea. And be, before that, you've got the, the historic chicory kiln and the old homestead. And then before that, and right in front of me, is this line of, of mostly community members. And they're all carrying the blue boxes with bandicoots inside them. And it was just such an amazing emotional sight. Yeah, I will never, ever, ever forget that night. It was just fantastic, you know, to, to be you know, there in the early days where we didn't have much support for the Eastern Broad Bandicoot project over there, to be there in 2019, you know, with most of the community members coming to the release and releasing the bandicoots onto their island, it was such a special, special night. And, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be working with the French Islanders and continue to work with them in monitoring the bandicoot population there. So over to you, Dave, what's, what's been your highlight or favourite memory of working on the Eastern Bar Bandicoot program? I think my highlight is quite similar to the other guys. Uh, getting the dogs out to the first EBB site has been the culmination of about six years work for me, I think. Um, so seeing those bandicoots run off through the, uh, the, the grasslands at night time as we let them out of their boxes with all our you know key players around was a was a magnificent moment and one i'll never forget and michael you have worked with eastern bride bandicoots for much longer than i have i'm sure you have many 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 special memories but if you had to pick one what is your your favorite memory of eastern bride bandicoots i guess uh I guess the thing that sticks in my mind, uh, uh, one occasion when we're doing field work down on Phillip Island, there was about two in the morning and we'd finished doing that monitoring that I showed you, um, sort of similar to what I showed you earlier on that video. Uh, we're walking back to the car and there's just a grassy area there and uh, there was a couple of Eastern Barb Bandicoots um, just foraging there, being just wild animals that you see out in the wild. And that was, that was fantastic because it spent, uh, uh, 20 plus years working with this species, but always, always like uh, really, you know, super um, rare species that we were dealing with in captivity or were handling and bleeding and transporting and in fenced enclosures and all this sort of stuff. But that was really a moment uh, where I felt like, wow, here's, here's this animal being a wild animal. It's doing its own thing. It doesn't care about us at all but it's just there because of all the efforts of all those people. And, you know, the part that, that the, the, I played and other vets played in it, but so many people, um, uh, yeah, really nice moment. So we're well on the road to recovering the Eastern Barred Bandicoot and the future of the species is looking bright and it may well be the very first species in Victoria to be re removed from the threatened species list. So while we would love to keep talking all things bandicoots and dogs, because we could talk all night about them, unfortunately, we are out of time. But thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. And more importantly, thank you for all of your support. But before you go, don't miss this last video. It features some of our amazing guardian dogs and the release of the bandicoots into the Skipton Reserve late last year. Thanks everyone and have a great night. Bye.
So this National Trust property here at Skipton was chosen for a research trial because it was once one of the last strongholds of the species as they were going into decline. We've now been working at this site for three years getting ready for the release of the bandicoots. So conservation organisations like Zoos Victoria have been working on the Eastern Bard Bandicoot for something like 30 years. There's three different main ways that that's been happening. So captive breeding has been the big start. We brought them in and bred them up. Then we've released them into fence sites, which is a, yeah, a successful known outcome approach. After that, we've been looking at island releases. So Fox Free Islands, great safe place to let them go. And then now we're working on this new approach, which is the Guardian Dog Program. The Zoos Victoria Guardian Dog Program has been running for about five years and its primary purpose is to protect the Easter Bard Bandicoot from predation by cats and foxes. We're not teaching the dogs to bond with the bandicoots, we're actually bonding them to sheep. The sheep and the dogs and the bandicoots will all live in the same grassland. The dogs have been taught just to leave the bandicoots alone and stay away from them. That's all they really need to do. They protect their territory and the flock of sheep and then the foxes realise that that's a dog's territory and they stay out. If we can keep the foxes and, and other predators away from the bandicoots, they'll be able to thrive in these great little grassland spots and uh, potentially yeah, we'll be able to get the numbers up high enough to get them right off the threatened species list. Mm -hmm.